Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, students. Uh, today we will uh, start our first session with uh, Dr. Amrut Lal Patel. He is a scientist, deep and joint director of Gujarat Biotechnology Research Center. Uh, he has a vast professional experiences. Uh, he started as a veterinary surgeon at Vadora uh, Society for Prevention of <coughs> Cruelty to Animals. Hello, uh, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, students. Uh, today we will uh, then he was a veterinary officer at Badora Diary and then joined as a scientist as a, in Zydus Research Center, Cadilla Healthcare, India. And then he was in, as a research assistant at, at Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, uh, uh, Canada. Then for, followed by he was a research associate with the Department of Animal Biotechnology, Anand Agriculture University, India, and as a, also as a consultant, uh, Accelerase Labs, Anand Agriculture University. Uh, he joined as a principal scientist at uh, R&D, uh, Hester Bioscience uh, Limited, India, and then joined as a research associate at Gujarat Biotechnology Research Center from 2019. And uh, 2020, he joined, worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, International Vaccine Center, Canada. Uh, he joined uh, GBRC from November, November 2020 to present. He is as a joint director. Uh, he has a vast number of uh, publications, more than 50 plus research publications in a uh, national and international journals, uh, two patents, and then four book chapters, uh, 10 GenBank submissions to his credit, and more than uh, 10 uh, abstracts in conferences, uh, in international and national level conferences. So with this short introduction, I invite uh, Dr. Amrutlal Patel to deliver his talk. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, doctor, for uh, giving my introduction. So, is my screen visible? Ah, uh, yes, doctor. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today, uh, I am going to talk about the applications of biotechnology in veterinary medicine. So, just to give a brief description of what biotechnology and veterinary medicine is. Biotechnology is basically an area of biology that uses the living processes, organisms or systems or part thereof to manufacture the products or technology intended to improve the quality of life. Now in biotechnology, there are several disciplines uh, in all the, almost all the disciplines biotechnology is uh, applied, including animal biotechnology, medical biotechnology, plant biotechnology, industrial biotechnology, environmental biotechnology, and marine biotechnology. And if you look at the places where all this work is going on, then you will find that GBRC, Gujarat Biotechnology Research Center, is one of such places where uh, biotechnology work uh, across all these disciplines is going on. Uh, veterinary medicine is basically a branch of medicine that deals with the prevention, control, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases, disorder, and injury in animals. So if you, most of you must be aware that in veterinary medicine, there are a number of animal species, including cow, buffalo, sheep, goat, horse, donkey, camel, elephant, pig, dog, cat, lion, tiger, leopard, other wild animals, poultry, many other birds. So you can understand the complexity or diversity of animal species uh, we deal with in the uh, veterinary medicine. Uh, if you look at the anatomy as well as physiology of these animals are uh, different uh, from one to uh, another species. As well as you will see, there is a difference in the line of treatment, uh, difference in the uh, num uh, type of diseases occur in different animals. So altogether, veterinary medicine uh, is uh, actually a very challenging job. And uh, you have to understand the uh, 
medicinal aspect of very much diverse uh, range of species uh, of animals. So, if somebody is uh, interested to pursue the veterinary medicine, he has to understand that there is a lot of complexity is compared to the human medicine. But uh, as far as uh, the depth of uh, street line of treatment is concerned, uh, you have a very much advanced technology in the human medicine like surgery, heart surgery, brain surgery, that type of uh, deep uh, uh, advanced aspect is not we are dealing uh, uh, routinely in the animals. <clears throat> so, uh, talking about the applications of biotechnology in veterinary medicine, the biotechnology can be applied to develop the vaccines, to develop the diagnostics, to develop the technologies to enhance the animal production, to uh, work on the technologies involved in the uh, reproductive technologies. Then there are upcoming areas like metagenomics, especially some of the important uh, areas uh, in the animal uh, biology like uh, rumen uh, in the la livestock animals or uh, you can say cecum in the poultry. Uh, students, please stay with us. I think there is some uh, network issues with uh, Dr. Ambutla. We will try to reconnect him as soon as possible. So actually, there is a breakage of power supply. Oh, okay. I started with the, my uh, uh, mobile uh, internet. Okay. Hello, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, doctor, you can continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, there are areas like gene therapy, which we can apply in the, uh, especially in the canine species, 
as well as there are decision decisions in the other large animal also where we can apply gene therapy then there are areas like in this very important stem um then uh, uh, development of recombinant proteins and antibodies for diagnostic as well as therapeutics then there are uh, you know, scope in the transgenic bioreactor where we can do molecular farming especially in the milk uh, production of recombinant proteins in the milk of the uh, large animals uh, or uh, in the serum or urine of the animals Uh, then there is a uh, very good scope in the enhancement of disease resistance in the different animal species so first of all we talk about the vaccines vaccines is basically a substance used to stimulate the production of antibodies and provide immunity against one or several diseases and these are basically prepared from the positive agent of the disease its product or even it can be a synthetic and it is basically treated to act as an antigen without inducing the disease so if you look at the number of uh, veterinary diseases it can uh, list can be more than hundreds uh, but i have listed here only few important veterinary diseases where vaccine is uh, very much important like uh, brucellosis foot and mouth disease uh, tuberculosis rabies Yeah, avian influenza, infectious bursal disease, and Newcastle disease. These three are the uh, avian uh, poultry diseases. Then sheep pox, goat pox, uh, lumpy skin diseases, uh, anthrax, leptospirosis, canine distemper, babesiosis, trypanosomiasis, and thylacinosis. So these are the important veterinary diseases which cause uh, great economic loss in the uh, uh, animal uh, husbandry. so traditionally when you look at the vaccines they were generally uh, produced as uh, killed vaccine or uh, live alternated vaccines so killed vaccines are basically you grow the virus or bacteria the pathogen and then inactivate uh, with the help of formaldehyde or uh, beta propionolactone like inactivating agents and that inactivated vaccine uh, you use uh, uh, for vaccination whereas in the live attenuated vaccines uh, you basically passage the pathogen into a non natural host for several passages more than 50 passages to attenuate the virulence to uh, reduce the virulence or pathogenicity of the organism uh, by growing in a uh, different host and by that way you produce the vaccine so those were the conventional vaccines uh, couple of decades ago and nowadays also we have number of vaccines uh, using the conventional approach uh, and uh, recently there is a new generation vaccines based on the biotechnological approaches and that uh, includes uh, viral vector based vaccines that you most of you must be aware that uh, in the Uh, this uh, covid shield the which is produced by the serum institute of india uh, they have used adenoviral vector chimpanzee adenoviral vector then dna vaccine that many of you have heard that zydas has developed uh, zycom d that all that is a dna vaccine uh, then protein subunit vaccines there are number of companies uh, companies like biologically he has developed uh, protein subunit vaccine based for the covid then multi epitope vaccines they where you combine the epitope of different antigens uh, uh, to um, enhance the, uh, uh, the uh, to broaden the uh, protection uh, so far there is no multi epitope vaccines in the market uh, for the covid then mrna based vaccine also also developed in the veterinary uh, uh, veterinary uh, side also and uh, uh, if you look at the how we develop the vaccines normally whenever there is a new pathogen what we have to do is uh, uh, to sequence the genome of the pathogen 
uh, to identify the which genes are responsible for induction of the Doctor, we cannot hear you. Your voice is not good. Doctor? Hello. Hello. Ah, doctor, can you hear us? Now, now, yeah. So there was disconnection. Yeah, yeah. In between, there was a disconnection. Oh, sorry. I was going on speaking. Okay. So, where was I before? Uh, can you share your slides? slides? Oh, it is not visible. Ah, uh, slides are not visible. Oh. Uh, seventh slide, doctor. From seven. Yeah. Okay, this slide it was. Yes, yes. So, whenever uh, we encounter any pathogen and we want to develop a vaccine, first of all, what we do is to sequence the pathogen to identify the which genes are responsible for inducing the antibody response. And after identifying those genes, uh, we have to go, go for cloning of the genes to develop a different type of vaccines like DNA vaccine, subunit vaccine, and uh, vector vaccine. So this is the whole flow chart of the uh, vaccine development, uh, right from sequencing of the pathogen to identify the uh, vaccine targets and then clone them in a different vectors for either for uh, DNA vaccine or vi viral vector vaccine or protein-based vaccine. And then uh, either you pro grow the recombinant virus for viral vector vaccine or grow the uh, uh, express the proteins for the protein subunit based vaccine. And after preparing the antigen uh, or the virus, the recombinant virus, uh, you have to go for immunization in the mice uh, in the preclinical model uh, where you study the antibody response and cell mediated immune response in the mice against your target antigen. Uh, and then uh, after uh, identifying that it uh, induces the protective antibody response and good CMI response, we have to go for the uh, clinical trial in humans. So this is the long way uh, we have to follow for the vaccine development. So there are a number of vaccines which are developed for the veterinary medicines. Uh, using different approaches like DNA vaccines, protein subunit vaccine, chimeric protein vaccines, uh, chimeric viral vaccines, and uh, viral vector uh, based vaccines. So, uh, there are uh, different examples also here given uh, for uh, which uh, viral vac uh, vaccines have been developed against different pathogens. So in the uh, DNA vaccine, you just clone the your gene of interest in a plasmid and directly as such plasmid you use as a vaccine. Whereas in the protein subunit vaccine, first you have to clone and express the protein in a suitable host like bacteria or mammalian cell or insect cell and purify the protein and that protein you have to adding, uh, mixing with some adjuvant you use as a vaccine. In chimeric protein vaccine, you target more than one antigen. So you have a two, three different antigens uh, against particular pathogen or more than one pathogen and then that you uh, use as a vaccine. Then in chimeric viral vaccine, your uh, antigen for specific uh, pathogen is expressed on the coat uh, of the viral uh, capsid. And that itself uh, also acts as an antigen. So that is a chimeric viral vaccine. Whereas in the viral vector vaccines, 
your antigen against the pathogen is not present on the port of the or capsule of the uh, vector, but uh, it is gene of interest or target gene against particular uh, pathogen is expressed is cloned in the genome of the virus and that is expressed after infection on or after uh, injecting the vaccines so in the viral vector based vaccines there are a number of uh, there is a big list and uh, uh, you can see that uh, there are uh, number of companies uh, which are developing and uh, which have developed these vaccines like boringer pfizer joetis Merck, Seva, these are number of uh, companies who have developed these vaccines uh, against different pathogens in uh, different animal species like canine, feline, equine, swine, bovine, avian, even wildlife and rabbits. Uh, against the different pathogens like uh, canine distemper, feline leukemia, rabies, equine influenza, West Nile. Uh, there is a long list of different diseases in different animal species. And these vaccines are available in the market. So, uh, using the biotechnology based approach, number of vaccines have, have been de already developed in the veterinary uh, side. Then, the next uh, is important aspect is the development of diagnostics in uh, veterinary medicine. So, diagnosis, as you know, that traditionally it uh, was done based on the uh, conventional method like bacterial isolation or viral isolation uh, or doing the hematology analysis or looking for the parasites in the blood, like that conventional methods were used for the diagnosis in the past. But nowadays, uh, uh, during the COVID, you might have noticed that. Uh, RT-PCR based diagnosis of COVID or rapid antigen based diagnosis of COVID. So these are the biotechnology based methods. And so we can basically detect the uh, pathogen by detecting the antigen of uh, that particular pathogen or antibody against that pathogen or the nucleic acid, DNA or RNA of... Sorry. Uh, DNA or RNA of that pathogen. And uh, this nucleic acid based diagnosis can also be applied to uh, detect the genetic diseases. So these are number of uh, different uh, molecular tools which are used for the diagnosis uh, of animal diseases. And uh, first is the PCR and real time PCR based. Uh, there are number of uh, companies who have, like ID that have developed the PCR based diagnosis of these uh, veterinary diseases. Uh, there are also tests like ELISA, which are used for detecting the antigen or antibody against that particular pathogen. They are also developed by a number of companies like uh, IDEX, Symbiotic, IDVET, uh, UBIO. Then there are rapid assays like lateral flow assay, uh, this particular. Uh, strip based assays uh, have been, you might have uh, seen during the COVID that this type of uh, rapid assays are also developed in the veterinary medicine. In India, also, there is one company, UBio, is manufacturing uh, this type of lateral flow based assay for the veterinary uh, diagnostics. Then, NGS, as you know, it is very much crucial for diagnosing the novel pathogen whenever you have a, a new outbreak. Um, then, um, if you don't know which pathogen it is, then you cannot you directly go for PCR because you don't know which target or which sequence to target. So, in that type of type of cases, next generation sequencing is used. For example, in COVID, also when there was first outbreak in Wuhan, uh, it was diagnosed by next generation sequencing. Whole the, uh, genome of the virus have been uh, was sequenced by the NGS technologies. Then there are another biotechnology based tools like microarray have been applied uh, for diagnosing the genetic uh, uh, defects like uh, duplication or deletions of particular genes or uh, even uh, enucleolis, uh, abnormality in the number of chromosomes. Those are diagnosed uh, you know, already in practice by uh, microarray techniques. 
so the next uh, important aspect is the, uh, to develop the technologies to enhance the animal production so traditionally animal production uh, was enhanced by selective breeding like you know that during the process of domestication and uh, uh, by selective breeding we have improved the milk production uh, as well as other uh, important traits in the livestock animals uh, by selective breeding that breeding the only the high producing animals uh, uh, we have been able to improve the uh, number of uh, Uh, traits in the animals but nowadays by, by biotechnological approaches we can use the transgenic technology or knockout technology or genomic selection to directly introduce the uh, new traits or to delete the pathogenic trait or the susceptible loci in the animals so uh, there is uh, one uh, uh, example of natural mutations uh, in the belgian blue cattle uh, where mutations in the myostatin gene uh, have been uh, associated with the double muscling phenotype in the this cattle so you can see that this cattle uh, have are physiologically normal but their muscle mass is double than the uh, normal animals so this mute um, uh, mutation in the myostatin can be uh, exploited in the animal uh, side to enhance the meat production in the animals and uh, in this directions uh, we work in the anand veterinary college and we did uh, um, good research for a couple of years and uh, we published uh, several papers also on the uh, myostatin knockdown by rna interference techniques and uh, we have been able to demonstrate the you know, knockdown of myostatin uh, in the cell culture model and further work uh, was required to introduce this myostatin knockdown in the animals so that work is still pending uh, then another approach is the genomic selection where you first identify the important uh, phenotype uh, and uh, trait uh, genotype associated with the phenotype so you screen the thousands of snp by different microarray platform snp microarray platform and uh, first uh, identify the association between those snp and uh, uh, those high producing uh, sing phenotypes and derive the equations from a reference population then after deriving equations from a reference population then you can use uh, that uh, equation for judging or estimating the breeding value of any of the cattle uh, or newborn progeny so uh, right away after the birth you can identify by genomic selection that this uh, progeny is going to produce the high milk or high meat in the uh, in its life span so likewise genomic selection can be used to enhance the animal production the next area is the assisted reproductive technologies there are number of technologies like uh, artificial insemination multiple ovulation and embryo transfer semen sexing ivf icc embryo sexing somatic cell nuclear transfer these have been uh, routinely practiced uh, in the western world as well as in the india also so as many of you know that artificial insemination is basically collecting a semen from a, a progeny tested bull the bull which has been tested for the high milk production capacity of that uh, offspring that semen of that bull is used to inseminate the thousands or millions of cows or buffaloes that is artificial insemination and that is uh, now most of the 90% of the animals in the india are uh, bred uh, using the artificial insemination nowadays then um, semen sexing is uh, is one of the um, tool to uh, separate the male and female uh, gametes from the semen so as you know that x bearing spermatozoa has a higher uh, dna content compared to y bearing spermatozoa you can separate by dna binding dye staining with dna binding dye and through the flow cap tax machine frozen activated cell sorter 
where uh, higher charge will be applied to the x bearing sperm compared to y and based on the charge difference uh, this uh, droplets are separated uh, in the different tubes so the, uh, using the sorted semen we can produce only female offspring because you know that in uh, india um, uh, there is a, a cow is considered as sacred animal and if, during natural fertilization 50% uh, of the uh, progeny are produce are male so those males are unproductive and they are going to be slaughtered so that is um, uh, not uh, good in uh, in terms of india because uh, in india animals are considered as sacred so if you have this technology you can produce most of the animals which are female so that thereby you can enhance the animal production then uh, there is a um, uh, techniques like intracytoplasmic sperm inje uh, injection or uh, in vitro fertilization where you can produce the embryos outside the uh, uh, uterus where uh, in uh, in vitro fertilization you normally add the million of spermatozoa uh, in the oocyte and one of the sperm gets uh, inserted into the oocyte uh, during fertilization whereas in ipc you pick up one sperm using the pipette and then uh, inject inside this sperm with the help of micromolecules so this techniques are extensively used in the human ivf nowadays and uh, it has also been a practice in some of the advanced uh, <coughs> ivf center in the animal also then one more area is embryo sexing because in i uh, this uh, sorted semen the survival of the embryos is less so if you do embryo sexing uh, after generating embryo if you identify whether it is x or y bearing um, or xy Uh, then uh, it can be uh, used to screen the male and female embryo and uh, you can uh, generate uh, produce the female offspring specifically then there is a technique like somatic cell nuclear transfer that we will see in the next slide uh, this is the multiple ovulation and embryo transfer this technique is as, uh, basically used to enhance the animal female animals uh, use of female animals which are genetically superior so it, in the normal uh, life span animal is able to produce 10 or some odd offspring so whereas uh, with the help of moet uh, you can uh, produce hundreds of offspring from the same animal so if you identify that this animal is genetically superior or producing high milk production then that particular animal you do moet multiple ovulation embryo transfer and those embryo you transfer uh, into the animals which are not genetically superior so thereby you can enhance the use of genetically superior females to enhance the uh, production then somatic cell nuclear transfer is one of the uh, approach uh, that uh, many of you must have heard that cloning uh, of sheep that dolly which was very popular in 97 Uh, so here uh, what they have done is uh, they have taken the mammary gland cell of the uh, fin dorsate eve uh, that is female and uh, uh, then from that mammary gland cell they have taken the nucleus and transferred into the oocyte of the another um, uh, eve that is scotic black face eve so from this eve they have taken the embryo they have removed their uh, uh, nucleus of that embryo instead of that nucleus of the mammary gland cell of the fin dorsate eve was uh, introduced into the embryo and from this they have developed the uh, embryo and generated the progeny that progeny looked exactly like the fin dorsate eve from where the mammary gland cell were taken so this technique uh, can be used Uh, also to uh, produce the offspring from the somatic cells directly from the somatic cell then one more area uh, which can be exploited is the metagenomics metagenomics is basically a study of collection of genetic material from a mixed community of organism so basically what we do in metagenomics is we isolate the dna from a whole community uh, representing bacteria virus fungi protozoa and 
I we isolate DNA from those um, uh, community and fragment it and proper sequencing. So after sequencing, we assemble uh, uh, this DNA and identify the genome as well as genes. So we uh, we also identify which bacteria it is, uh, which uh, taxonomy it is, like uh, taxonomic profiling as well as functional profiling. So now, uh, as you know that a human in animal, uh, especially the livestock animal, uh, cow, buffalo, sheep, goat, uh, it is very much important for the digestion of the food because the animal are eating grass and grass is very difficult to digest. So a human carries number of bacteria, different types of bacteria, protozoa, fungi, bacteriophages, viruses, and all together, those microorganisms carry out the fermentation in the rumen and to degrade the uh, grass eaten by the animals. And they uh, degrade this highly complex polysaccharide in uh, less than 24 hours uh, to metabolites. So uh, they carry a rich source of enzymes which are important in the degradation of the polysaccharides. So we, uh, we identify which enzymes are present in those uh, mi microorganisms we can clone and express and use in the industry or as a feed supplement to enhance the digestibility of the animal feed. So we work in this direction at Anand Veterinary College and we published almost 42 papers from the rumen metagenomics. Uh, and uh, we also did enzyme isolation from this uh, rumen and uh, we published four papers and one patent uh, for the uh, isolating different enzymes from the uh, rumen of uh, different uh, cows and buffalo. Then uh, one more area is the uh, gene therapy where uh, uh, which we can apply in the animal uh, side. Uh, gene therapy is basically techniques that introduce the genetic modification in the uh, person. To, with a aim to treat or cure the diseases. And it works by several mechanisms, either by replacing the disease-causing gene with a healthy copy, or by inactivating the disease-causing gene, or by introducing a new or modified gene into the body to treat the disease. So there are two approaches in the gene therapy, ex vivo gene therapy and in vivo gene therapy. So in ex vivo gene therapy, what we do is we uh, isolate the cells from a person and in those cells we introduce genetic modifications in laboratory and after introducing genetic modification and uh, characterizing that these cells are modified we inject back back into the patient so that is ex vivo gene therapy whereas in in vivo we directly introduce the nucleic acid carrying the uh, target gene of interest uh, either by encapsulating by nanoparticles or by viral vectors. So uh, these viral vectors uh, carrying different viral vectors like adeno viral vector, adeno associated viral vector, antiviral vectors. These vectors carry your uh, target gene of interest and we introduce this gene into the target site of the patient to introduce the desired changes. So there are a number of monogenic diseases in the animals which can be treated by the gene therapy like retinal degeneration, progressive retinal atrophy, uh, congenital amyloresis, x linked retinacid, this uh, pigmentosa, acromotopsia, hemophilia A and B, and leukocyte adhesion deficiency. So you, if you look at the uh, gene therapy attempts which are already made in animals, Right from uh, 1993, uh, this successful attempt of gene therapy were made in canine for hemophilia B for replacing the or correcting the factor 9, blood clotting factor 9 through retroviral vector. Uh, then in 96, for uh, the successful attempt was made for hemophilia A for factor 8 uh, through adenoviral vector. Then there are a uh, number of attempts for muscular dystrophy, other diseases. Uh, using the uh, different viral vector like adeno associated retroviral and uh, uh, foamy virus vectors uh, for correcting the different genes uh, uh, against the uh, different uh, diseases. 
then one more area is uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, which we can work in the animal side. Uh, induced pluripotent stem cells are basically a type of uh, pluripotent stem cells that can be generated from the somatic cells. So, uh, what we normally do in uh, IPSC is that uh, we treat the somatic cell with the reprogramming factors like uh, OX4, OX2, KLF4, NANO, LIM28, uh, CMI. Those are the uh, transcription factors we introduce by uh, different uh, plasmids or, uh, or lentiviral vector into the somatic cells. And after expressing those rep reprogramming factor for 10 days to 20 days, depending on the type of the cells or depending on the type of expression of those transcription factor it takes, two to three weeks to develop into induced pluripotent stem cells. And these cells have the ability to uh, differentiate into any type of cell in the uh, body. So uh, during the repro reprogramming, what happens is uh, basically there is a deep differentiation. So somatic cells are basically differentiated cells. But when you reprogram, it undergoes de differentiation so it's loss of epigenetic modifications. And uh, after that, it becomes the stem cells. So stem cells have the capacity to uh, differentiate into the endoderm, ectoderm, or mesoderm, and any kind of cells in the body. So in the uh, veterinary medicines, it is a promising platform uh, for disease modeling, drug, and toxicity testing, biomarker development, and cell-based therapies. Uh, especially in regenerative medicine, Large animals are better all, no, model for men compared to the small animals because they represent uh, similarity in the physiology. And then uh, also we can develop this, apart from the model for human, we can also develop the therapeutic product for the animal itself. And when we do gene therapy in animals, it generates say, some kind of information that we can use in the human clinical trials. So these are the number of applications of IPSC in the uh, different areas like disease modeling, transgenic animal generation, human organ generation in domestic animals, gametes or embryo derivation, uh, basic research, biodiversity preservation, biomarker development and drug toxicity screening as well as cell-based therapies for regenerative medicine. So in this direction, our lab has initiated work in veterinary college Anand and the fellow went to Manipal Institute, Bangalore, and they uh, did uh, canine, they generated canine-induced uh, pluripotent stem cells uh, from the skin fibroblast uh, and characterized uh, and found that it is in between mouse and human IPSCs. The marker expression is uh, mimicking some part of mouse and some part of human IPSCs. So uh, this is some of the little bit work we have done in this direction for the IPSC. The another area is uh, uh, development of recombinant proteins for diagnostics as well as therapeutics. So they, uh, there are some promising uh, candidates we can target like uh, FSH, follicle stimulating hormones or single domain antibodies. Like FSH, uh, uh, it is e uh, important in the development of follicles in the ovary. So uh, FSH is normally produced in the brain from the pituitary gland. And from pituitary gland, it is secreted into the bloodstream. And through bloodstream, it goes to the ovary uh, near the uh, uterus. And in ovary, it acts on the uh, uh, primordial oocytes to develop into the mature uh, oocytes. So when we use uh, multiple injection of FSH, instead of one oocyte, we can develop 10 or 15 oocytes in a single cycle. So thereby we can enhance the number of uh, uh, follicle development and uh, number of progenies. So now to do the FSH production, what people have normally done is they isolate the mRNA coding for the FSH. Uh, two subunits, alpha and beta subunits, uh, it has. And so this, um, uh, uh, they combine this alpha and beta subunit in uh, one of the plasmid vector and uh, transfect in the, the mammalian cells like Cho cells and express these uh, proteins in the uh, Cho cells and uh, purify and use as a, uh, use for injection. 
So once you develop the cell line, uh, stably expressing the FSH uh, alpha and beta subunit, you have to grow in a bulk from flask to roller bottle to fermenter. And from fermenter, you purify uh, the FSH by different chromatography techniques and go for quality testing, functional assay, as well as for the structural assays of the protein. Uh, and then you release uh, the drug into the market. So there is a long uh, timeline for the production of FSH and there is a huge potential of this FSH in the animal uh, husbandry, uh, especially in the uh, IVF and multiple ovulation and embryo transfer technology. Another important uh, topic is this uh, chameleon single domain antibodies. Uh, where uh, single domain antibodies, uh, as you know, that uh, our conventional antibodies are made up made up of two heavy chains and two light chains. Even if you take monoclonal antibody, the, it is made up of two heavy chains and two light chains. Whereas in the single domain antibody, uh, in the uh, heavy chain, there is only heavy chain, and in heavy chain also there is uh, CH1 region is absent. Only variable region is there. So it is made up of single uh, domain, variable heavy chain domain. So it is very small, almost 15 kilo Dalton compared to 150 kilo Dalton of the IgG. So these antibodies are very stable and soluble uh, in the expression, different expression system. And uh, uh, they can be purified from the camelid uh, nave as well as immunized VHH antibody library and expressed in the E. coli or yeast expression systems. So another important area where we can work in the animal husbandry is the transgenic bioreactor. So transgenic bioreactor is basically uh, the uh, molecular farming or fermenter, uh, live fermenter. So you, what you do is uh, normally when you uh, express the recommended protein, you go for Cho cell line or uh, in the um, uh, fermenter system. Instead of that, you can do the same thing. You clone those, uh, uh, like for example, antithrombin gene in the introduced into the uh, uh, zygote of the animal. And once it gets integrated into the zygote, uh, you produce the animal uh, which carries that uh, human protein. Uh, uh, into the animal and in the uh, depending on the type of promoter used like if you use milk protein promoter it will secrete the protein into the milk so uh, by that way you can produce the transgenic animal and there are a number of reports uh, or studies have been done and this uh, li big list of recommended proteins which are produced from transgenic rabbit so these are the list of protein like antitrypsin uh, alpha glucosidase, human C1 in the protein factor 8, erythropoiety, growth hormone. These are number of proteins which are expressed in the rabbit milk uh, using the different promoters uh, uh, like uh, antitrypsin, alpha 1 antitrypsin, alpha S1 casein, way acidic protein promoters, alpha S1 casein promoter, beta casein promoter. These promoters will direct the foreign gene expression into the milk. And this is the expression level they have obtained. So uh, uh, this is one of the promising approach. We can re uh, reduce the cost of production of the recommended proteins. Then uh, one more area uh, is the introducing the disease resistance in animals. So as we have already talked that selective breeding can bring some of the important traits in the animals, uh, but it takes long time to introduce the uh, stable introduce the uh, specific trait in the population and as well as um, now it will also bring some of the negative traits along with the uh, positive traits. Whereas genomic selection, you can target number of traits at the same time and improve the uh, performance of the animals. Uh, but with the help of biotechnological approaches like transgenic and gene editing, we can directly introduce or delete the genes which is not good for uh, susceptible against particular disease and uh, um, we can produce the animal which are resistant to particular diseases. So this is one of the study recently published in 2015 uh, where they have produced transgenic cattle with resistance, disease resistance to tuberculosis. So they have produced TB resistant uh, cattle because TB is very much common in the cattle uh, and buffalo. 
so this uh, they used uh, talent mediated uh, knocking of uh, sp110 mouse uh, mouse nuclear body protein uh, they introduced into the cattle and they uh, demonstrated that this uh, sp110 protein uh, introduced uh, uh, has uh, led to the resistance to tuberculosis in the uh, cattle so these are number of uh, different areas where we can uh, work in the animal husbandry or in the veterinary medicine through biotechnology so this was all about uh, biotechnology applications in veterinary medicine from my side if, if any questions i will be happy to answer thank you so much doctor the session is open for a discussion if you have any questions or clarifications, you can ask Dr. Ram. Yeah. Any questions? So there is one uh, question from Bijendra Singh. Uh, how do we cut gene segment? Uh, that, uh, uh, he has asked. There are different approaches like CRISPR-Cas9 uh, can be used to cut the gene segment. It can give the, you have to uh, define the target sequence uh, in the CRISPR-Cas9 where we can uh, use the uh, this ta target sequence and based on that target sequence it will specifically cut at that site. Similarly, talon and zinc finger nucleus also we can uh, introduce the specific uh, DNA binding uh, sites uh, into the uh, engineer into the talon and zinc finger nucleus also. Any other questions? If no more questions, then we Thank Dr. Amrit Lal Patel for joining us today and giving us a extensive knowledge and sharing his knowledge on a veterinary medicine, how to develop the veterinary medicine and what are the various aspects we can follow, what are the different types of uh, things we can follow, technology we can follow to deliver the medicines and disease resistance, develop disease resistance in cattle. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramdhan, for joining us. Uh, th thank you for inviting, and I am sorry for the interruption caused by the power failure. Uh, that's okay. It happens. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, students, uh, please be with us. Our next lecture uh, might join us anytime soon.
Good morning, Dr. Sandhya. Hello. Ah, good morning, Doctor. Can good morning, Doctor Morgan. Sorry, I just got a bit delayed. It's yeah. okay. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, students, we will continue with our second session for the day. Uh, we have with us Doctor Sandeep Goyal, scientist chef from uh, National Institute of Animal Biotechnology, Hyderabad. Uh, Doctor Sandeep Goyal is a veterinarian with a PhD in reproductive biology from uh, Kyoto University, Japan. He spent 20 years at the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, CCMB Hyderabad, as a scientist and a team leader. Uh, there he researched reproductive biotechnology of domestic and wild animals uh, with specific emphasis on stem cell biology, animal transgenesis, uh, testis biology, spermatogenesis, and cryobiology. He has authored uh, more than uh, 50 scientific papers, book chapters, and research articles. Uh, Dr. Goyal was a visiting faculty of Georgetown Medical School, USA and Kyoto University, Japan. Dr. Goyal is currently working as the at the National Institute of Animal Biotechnology, Hyderabad, uh, developing uh, mission chimal stem cell cryobanking for allogenic and autologous transplantation to aid in the widespread uh, clinical application in livestock and company animals. Uh, so with this uh, short introduction, I invite Dr. Goyal to deliver his talk. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Morgan. And uh, I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to interact with the uh, wonderful young mind uh, so that, you know, I can share my research experience and thought with them. So is my, is my screen visible on the, on the. Yes, yes, sir. we can go to full screen. So it's, it is full screen actually, you know, every time I have this, <laughs> okay, let me try again. Can you can you see my slide moving? Uh, no, no, doctor, it's not moving. Let me let me try again. Okay. Can you see it now? Ah yes, doctor. Is it moving? Ah yes, good. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, good morning uh, once again. Uh, my name is Sandeep and I work for a, a, a national institute called as the National Institute of Animal Biotechnology which is a, uh, under the Department of Biotechnology and it is located at Hyderabad. Uh, you can see here the beautiful building of my institute and I actually run a lab here uh, in stem cell biology and uh, you know we actually uh, have uh, PhD students uh, who join us and also many master course students who come here for a short term training for six months. So uh, going to my, uh, so uh, to going to the today's talk, uh, uh, I'm going to talk today about the uh, role of biotechnology in animal production. Okay. So uh, let me define, I don't know, maybe the previous lecture, lecturer would have defined a little bit about biotechnology because I guess the talk was on the similar line. So biotechnology is a set of technique by which uh, living organism are modified for benefit of humans and other animals. Okay, this is a very, there are several definition of biotechnology and I have picked up this definition because I found this definition to be very apt. Because in current situation and in my institute also, we actually, you know, utilize this basic concept of biotechnology. So as you all know that biotechnology is not just a single entity, you know, it is a combination of several, several science altogether, which uh, uh, amalgamates into a single technique called as biotechnology. So it is a combination of genetics, biochemistry, food science, microbiology, electronics, biochemical engineering, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, food technology science, molecular biology, you know, so, so many technologies all comes together to, you know, uh, to form this single set of technology called as biotechnology. So uh, biotechnology and animal reproduction, I'm going to talk today where I'm going to focus basically on reproductive biotechnology. And if time would permit, I will also talk about genome editing technology and transgenic technology. Okay. 
So let's go to the first uh, uh, technology that I'm going to talk about. Biotechnology is reproductive biotechnology. Now, as you all know, reproduction is a very important aspect in animal repro in animal production because without reproduction uh, or without uh, uh, you know birth of a, a calf, there is no milk for the dairy industry, or there is no meat uh, if you don't have young ones coming out. You know from the meat producing animal like goat and sheep so reproduction is basically a very important aspect of uh, of animal production and therefore reproductive biotechnology has emerged as a very important area of uh, biotechnology in the past several years so in reproductive under the reproductive biotechnology there are several techniques that we use uh, the first one and the most promising one that has been proven so far is the artificial insemination then you have in vitro fertilization sex sorting of sperm reproductive cloning and embryo transfer technology okay so i'm going to talk one by one about all these techniques so that you know you get an understanding of what what all these techniques are so artificial insemination as the word say it is done artificially and you know so the by by uh, so if you see here this is a newspaper cutting from uh, uh, 2020 that in Madhya Pradesh alone, uh, uh, 70 cows are impregnated every hour through artificial insemination. Okay, so this is a scenario that this technology is so widespread and so applicable in case of animal production and animal husbandry that this one single technology has brought in the the white revolution in this country. You know, earlier I, I talked back about you know this technology is almost 40 years old. And it came in India somewhere in the 1960s or 70s. And then, you know, that and from that point of time, it has been, you know, extensively used in animal husbandry. So artificial insemination can be defined as the deliberate introduction of sperm into the female uterus or cervix for the purpose of achieving a pregnancy through in vivo fertilization by means other than sexual intercourse. So in this case, as the definition uh, you can uh, see here, that there is no sexual intercourse with the male and here what happens that the sperm is deposited artificially into the uh, by the uh, man made technique okay so uh, uh, so what happens that uh, let me explain you a little bit about the estrus or sexual receptivity of uh, cattle or most so all animals uh, except for humans they come in uh, they are sexually receptive in a defined period of time okay so for in case of cow a cow comes in estrus or heat every 21 days. And there is a very small time window of, uh, you know, 24 hours, 18 to 24 hours, where, you know, you can actually deposit the, uh, the semen or sperm in the uterine or the uh, reproductive tract of the animal so that the sperm can actually meet the ovum for fertilization. So ovulation takes place during this time. So it's very important that the sperm is deposited at a very specific time into the, uh, the the reproductive tract of the female cow so that you know she it can undergo a fertilization so a cow comes in estrus every 21 days the recurring set of physiological and behavioral changes that takes place from one period of estrus to another is called the estrus cycle okay so uh, i will not go much into detail that there are several several you know stages of estrus cycle like pro estrus estrus mest estrus and diestrus so the red you can see the red area here is the time window when the animal is actually showing physiological heat you know it shows a mounting behavior and at this time of time if you can you know uh, inseminate the cow you would like actually uh, you know achieve fertilization and there is a Im implantation of the embryo and pregnancy is set in okay so, uh, uh, so during this time, uh, the oocyte is released from the ovary and the oocyte then travels down the, the ovary duct, you know, and the fertilization takes place in the ovary duct. Okay. Very remember that the sperm has to travel all the way from vagina to cervix to the, through the uterus and reach here at the end of the ovary duct for fertilization. Okay. So the fertilization takes place in the ovary duct and when the fertilized embryo pass down towards the uterus and eventually implants itself into the uterus for the sustaination of pregnancy okay so this is really important to understand so uh, the advantage of artificial insemination that it is a very strong tool 
for enhancing or genetic improvement in the animal so in our country uh, uh, somewhere 30 years back we had only indigenous cattle you know the indigenous cattle uh, especially the uh, they are very poor uh, uh, in milk production okay we get like one or two liters of milk a day so what happens that with the event of uh, artificial in insemination in the dairy industry or animal husbandry we have had tremendous improvement in the milk production and that is because of the genetic improvement of our indigenous breed okay there is a rapid proof of male genetic superiority so what happens uh, you know if a male can inseminate only one female uh, in a day or maybe maximum two female in a day you know one uh, semen uh, ejaculate can actually produce hundreds of seminal straw because one ejaculate has so much of semen that you know so much of sperm that it can be divided into several doses so one one ejaculate can actually be utilized for inseminating 100 of females and furthermore availability of sire to inseminate is avail is is uh, is, uh, is reduced uh, is enhanced so what happens that in earlier time if uh, if a cow was in heat or it has to be inseminated uh, a male had to come you know to the farm to inseminate it now you the male doesn't have to come all the semen straw is frozen in liquid nitrogen and you can take out one semen straw and inseminate artificially danger of bull is removed so thus lot of male to male to female aggression was there disease is reduced by a lot of venereal disease or sexually transmitted diseases are also taken care of there is an improved management record keeping is better and it also economical you know because uh, one semen straw can cost from uh, rupees 20 to maybe depending on the breed some 100 rupees or 200 rupees but still it is economical to you know have this technique in place so uh, the steps of artificial in insemination is semen collection evaluation of semen extension of semen i told you that uh, uh, the semen is uh, is so concentrated with uh, sperm that you can actually dilute it to make it a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, into different straw to make several several for inseminating several cows and then you freeze the extended semen in uh, in liquid nitrogen and then when required then you can inseminate the cow in estrus so that is the steps of artificial insemination so this is how it is done semen is collected from a prized bull you know the best quality bull which is known to have uh, you know progeny tested and uh, which has known that the, the offspring has produced good amount of milk so the best bull is chosen and using an artificial vagina the the semen is collected and then this the semen is then uh, you know extended diluted and then frozen in liquid nitrogen at 196 degree centigrade um, i'm not going much into detail so basically the semen is then uh, stored in these straws these these are the straws the semen straw you know these are 2.25 ml semen straw or 0.5 ml semen straws are available in the market which has a factory plug from one side so the semen is uh, is injected inside these uh, semen straw and this side is sealed by heating so this this is the where you can actually frozen and the amount of semen is good enough to inseminate one cow okay so this is really wonderful technique that can you know extend the semen to a great extent okay and then this is transferred into liquid nitrogen containers here and you can see here these semen straws are color coded depending on the bull type that is there and then they are frozen in the liquid nitrogen and stored there for as long as you can you know so you can store the semen straw for years together so you know there has been a report of almost 40 years of uh, storage has also not affected the sperm motility okay so now uh, when the semen straw is required for insemination if the cow is brought to is is brought to the the hospital or to the semen center in estrus then what we do is we take out the semen straw and uh, from the liquid nitrogen and thaw it in a warm water bath at 35 degrees and then cut the one end of the straw which is the sealed end and then you we load it into a insemination gun this is how the insemination guns look like this is a steel uh, thing you pull back the plunger the plunger is pulled back and then you load the semen straw here after cutting the end of it and then put a, a sheet over it so that now then the semen straw is ready for insemination okay and then when the cow is uh, brought to the the travish and then you pass the so trans vaginal method is used for insemination one hand is inserted into the rectum and with the other hand the the uh, ai gun is pushed into the the vaginal canal and then it is guided through the the rectal palpation per rectal palpation 
and it is passed through the cervix here. So there is a cervix here uh, where you have to pass it through inside and at the end of the cervix by uh, you deposit the serum semen here and then you pull back the 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 ai gun and then you know let the uh, uh, bull back to the 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 brown okay so this is the technique of doing artificial insemination some of the people do uh, artificial insemination twice in the easter period once in the morning once in the evening for increasing the uh, chances of pregnancy okay so this is how it is done coming to the second technique called is artificial in vitro fertilization as the word say in vitro means it is done the in vitro fertilization is done in the dish in the petri dish so the in vitro fertilization is the process of creating embryos from oocyte or fertilized egg by fertilizing them with a semen in the petri dish oocyte are first collected from the ovaries of donor by ultrasound guided follicular aspiration they are then matured in petri dish for fertilization for 20 to 24 hours and oocyte is then developed in an incubator for 7 days at this point the resulting viable embryo are transferred into the recipient so basically what here this is the uh, cartoon to show that you take an elite cow you know this is an indigenous cow you collect the oocyte and you take the elite bull from there you can take the semen as i told you in the artificial insemination and then you do a in vitro fertilization and then you culture the embryo for certain period of time where they develop to a blastocyst stage either you can then freeze this embryo for further transfer or you can immediately transfer into surrogate mother to produce the young one okay um so this is the process how ovum pick up is done by ultrasound method so we have a ultrasound probe that is inserted into the vagina and one arm is actually inserted into the rectum to guide this probe and there is a needle long needle here with an aspiration pump attached to it and so what happened using this needle we aspirate the oocyte from the uh, antral follicle antral follicle is the one which is fluid filled follicle and when we aspirate the follicle outside and then uh, sorry oocyte outside and once in the petri dish they are uh, you know uh, incubated with the spermatozoa and in vitro fertilization takes place and then we allow them to develop into uh, a, a later stage embryos and these embryos are then transferred okay so this is a, a method also which can be used for genetic selection of embryo so uh, here again i'm showing the same uh, uh, cartoon here what happens that we do a ovum pick up by ultrasound method take the oocyte subject into in vitro fertilization okay and then you culture them uh, uh, to a higher stage of uh, development like blastocyst and you take a small biopsy of this embryo you know small piece of it without hampering the the viability of the embryo and then you subject them to genome selection okay by using some technique that we have developed in nib and, and then you can use a good quality embryo only for embryo transfer to produce a prized animal okay so very recently nib has developed a, a D, snp chip called as indigao india first dna genome chip for the conservation of pure breed of indigenous cattle breed which was released by uh, the ministry of science and technology uh dr jitender singh in the uh, one of these uh, uh, presentation and this is how it looks like so we can actually genotype the 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 pure breed of indigenous cattle breed now okay so um so now uh, you know we can also use in vitro fertilization for genome editing i'll talk about this a little more later that you can take the in vitro fertilized embryos and and using this embryo you can actually man manipulate the the genome of the embryo by different techniques av available like crispr cas9 or talon and then you know once you have edited the genome of the embryos you can actually culture this embryo take the biopsy and then again sequence for the genome editing event and then do a embryo transfer to produce a very genetic superior technique so in vitro fertilization allows you a many many ways of you know uh, manipulating the genome of uh, of a uh, of a uh, animal okay now coming to the another technique that i was talking about sex sorting of sperm this is a very important technique in animal husbandry obviously sexing of uh, fetus is a crime in case of uh, human uh, babies but in case of animals uh, we actually prefer having a female calf because female uh, animals can give produce milk and therefore there are very important in dairy industry but uh, so for doing that you know that uh, there are x and y bearing sperm 
and if we are able to fertilize uh, the oocyte with only egg bearing sperm we will only get female and therefore it is a very important technique for producing only female so sex sex of the spermatozoa decide the sex of the embryo we all know that facts can be used for fluorescent assisted cell sorting facts can be used to sort out sperm based on the difference in dna content i'll talk about it a little more later and spermatozoa are separated into x and y chromosome bearing population that can be used for in vitro fertilization or artificial insemination so basically what happened testis is the source of spermatozoa and it is starts from spermatogonia you know which is uh, x and y bearing sperm x and y bearing cell and they eventually undergo meiosis to produce two kind of uh, spermatozoa uh, x bearing sperm and y bearing sperm you know that right so what happens that the x and the y has a difference in the amount of dna content because the y chromosome is much smaller than the x chromosome so utilizing and exploiting this uh, difference what we do is we subject these uh, sperm to vital dye vital dye is a dye which actually binds to the dna without compromising on the viability of the uh, of the uh, sperm okay so you can see here that the x bearing sperm would bind to more amount of vital dye as compared to y bearing sperm and when they are subjected to laser you know they emit different amount of light so y bearing x bearing sperm emits more light then the y bearing sperm because it absorbs more light so therefore it emits more light okay so when we subject this uh, these uh, uh, you know uh, uh, labeled sperm through a sorter and you can see here that the there is a, a charge been assigned by based on the based on the amount of emission done by these so there is a, a charge been assigned to these y and x bearing sperm based on the emission done by these sperm and you can see with the magnetic field we deflect these sperm so the y bearing sperms are collected in one side x bearing sperm is collected in one side and uh, the dead sperm which do not bind because the vital dye only binds to the live sperm you can see the dead sperm is also separated separate uh, in a different container so we can sort this sort this y bearing sperm and x bearing sperm and use it further for artificial insemination or in vitro fertilization to produce a desired sex uh, calf in the dairy industry okay now coming to another technology that has been in picture for very long time uh, exactly in 2007 when dolly was cloned the sheep so reproductive cloning uh, has come into picture okay so in india uh, for the several years ndri has been cloning uh, buffaloes in their in, in their uh, you know institute so cloning is a process of producing similar populations of genetically identical individual through asexual means of reproduction without the use of sperm okay i'll talk about this technique so you can see here these are cloned uh, buffalo calves been produced by uh, central institute of research on buffalo hisar and this technique actually was developed at ndri so now cloning is a very common technique in india also uh, unlike many for western world okay so what is the advantage of cloning it can restore endangered species and conserve prized animal for example you have a prized bull you want to you know make several copies of that particular animal so you can use this technique okay it allows for the editing of gene in farm animal so since it is another technique where you can do a genome editing and it is an alternative method of generating transgenic animal as a bioreactor we'll talk about that as we go subsequently later in this lecture so very simple technique of doing uh, cloning is that you can take a simple egg you fertilize it and then you have an embryo with two cell stage you can split these two cells into single cells you know so each of them are coming from since they are coming from a single uh, fertilized embryo you will have them as genetically identical and then you can transfer it uh, into a surrogate to produce a genetically identical clones okay so this is a very te simple technique of doing it in the laboratory people have been doing it under the microscope so using a holding pipette here you can see here the two cell embryo you remove one of the blastomere by a micro pipette here and then transfer into a empty zona pellucida zona pellucida is the covering over the over the uh, the embryo which keeps it protected and then you can you can so these two embryos are genetically identical to each other so they are clone of each other okay now you can also do this kind of cloning by splitting the blastocyst bisection okay so blastocyst bisection is nothing but you take a blastocyst is a later stage embryo 
and cut it into half at a very center you know you can see uh, you they took out the blastom blastocyst from zona pellucida and cut it using a knife into two half you can see here and one half is inserted into another zona pellucida and you can see here these are identical uh, 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 embryos so they are cloned to each other okay uh, nuclear transfer is a technique where what you do is you take the nucleus from a embryonic cell or a somatic cell not the and you take the new and and you nucleate an oocyte and you transfer that nucleus of a somatic or a, a embryonic cell and put it into the you nucleated oocyte to produce an embryo so therefore this is a nuclear transfer technique okay this is an, uh, actually two types embryonic cell nuclear transfer when you use an embryo as a nuclear donor okay so you can use an uh, like this an eight cell state embryo you can take out the nucleus from uh the blastomere of the it's one of the embryo and you enucleate the oocyte and replace that uh, uh, embryo into this uh, enucleated oocyte and then you produce an embryo so this is actually coming out from the 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 genetic material is coming from the embryo of this origin okay similarly you can use a somatic cell this is how the dolly was produced somatic cell is any cell of a living organism other than the reproductive cell so you can take a egg or oocyte enucleate it remove the nucleus take the somatic cell nucleus and put it into the uh, into the enucleated oocyte and then you can you know produce uh, let it develop into a later stage embryos and you can transfer it into a surrogate mother to produce a live animal there is another technique which is known as therapeutic cloning which has come into picture very recently because uh, ethically speaking cloning is not allowed in in case of humans so what they have done is they have started using cloning for therapeutic reasons so what they do is there is that supposing you are in a need of a so supposing i am in a need of a stem uh, of a stem cell for myself because i am suffering from a very uh, uh, life threatening disease so what i they'll do is they take a egg cell remove the nucleus and take my skin cell and put my uh, skin cell nucleus into this somatic cell sorry in the oocyte so what happens that now genetically this uh, cell is from my body this embryo produces of my genetical origin and i can they can actually derive a stem cell line from the blastocyst and this can be used for uh, therapy for myself so what happened this is a concept of therapeutic cloning where you can engineered or design a specific stem cell for a given individual okay now coming to genome editing using somatic cell nuclear, nuclear transfer since uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer technique involves embryo you can use uh, you know different technique that i showed you like homologous recombination or genome editing technology like crispr cas9 zinc finger nuclease or you can do a homologous recombination or randomly also can insert a transgene into the embryos to produce the transgenic livestock this is an example of pig where pig has been produced by by somatic cell nuclear transfer for transgenesis for uh, gene targeting and for genome editing so if you look here uh, the normal transgenic method is very low efficient and the genome editing technology has increased the efficiency to almost 20 to 25 to 50% so the newer technique of genome editing has been very efficient in in in, in producing uh, 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 genetically modified livestock now coming to the another technique that uh, is very important in uh, in uh, animal reproduction is in embryo biotechnology is embryo transfer technology so all the embryos that is produced by ivf or somatic cell nuclear transfer needs to be transferred into a surrogate mother other than that embryo transfer is a process by which an embryo is collected from a donor female and then transferred into a recipient female where the embryo completes its development but the use of embryo transfer a genetic superior female produces more offspring than she could by natural reproduction so this differ from artificial insemination where genetically superior male produce more offspring artificial insemination uh, embryo transfer technology gives an opportunity to a genetic superior female to produce more offspring than she could produce by a natural reproduction okay so in an in an average a cow can produce one or two calves in a year maybe what maybe two calves in uh, one calves in uh, one year or maybe two calves in three years okay but if you see here in this picture this is a donor cow which has produced 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 calves in one time okay and this is a possibility by using this embryo transfer technology 
how is it done i'll tell you in detail okay so the advantage is that it increases the number of offspring sired from a superior female it results in faster genetic progress uh, obtain offspring from it can obtain offspring from old or injured animal also you know a prized animal which has been injured or have a you know some kind of injury you can still use the uh, the the genetic potential of these animals for producing a calf and it increases the farm income through embryo sales if you have excess embryo you can sell this embryo and its uh, exploration or improvement of embryo is easier than with live so you can also export the embryos to different countries or different places for example you have a very good quality of uh, you know ka ka uh, of cattle in, in punjab and you want to transfer uh, the good quality uh, uh, animal to uh, tamil nadu now it is very difficult to do it you know it, it is possible but it is very expensive to transport the whole animal so you can actually take the embryo in liquid nitrogen container in a small uh, you know straw and you can put it in liquid nitrogen container and transfer it to a uh, tamil nadu and do a embryo transfer and you can produce a live animal there so that is really amazing this technology a revolutionized so let's look at the step of artificial uh, embryo transfer technology you first select a donor cow you know then you do a super ovulation you have to actually do a Uh, injection regime of hormone like fsh lh to increase the number of embryo produced by the 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 cow because in generally in a general uh, easter cycle the cow will produce only one oocyte okay so we have to super ovulate the animal by you know sensitizing with hormone to produce more than one oocyte so over 7 to 8 or 10 actual 15 embryos can be produced and then you uh, do a super ovulation then you do an artificial insemination with a, uh, a high quality semen of a good sire and uh, after the super ovulation and then you collect the uh, the embryos non surgically by flushing it okay this is a technique you flush by uh, pbs and you select collect the embryo from the uterus and then you screen the embryos for good and bad quality and then high, only good quality embryos are transferred are either surgically or non surgically into a recipient now recipient is very important where you know it, it can actually in the same stage of uh, uh, of the uh, reproductive cyclicity as that of a donor and then you can produce a live offspring from the recipient okay so uh, super ovulation if you look at i was talking about this of super ovulation you can see here that in this particular super ovulated cow you can see that how many oocytes are produced 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 oocytes were produced in this uh, hormonal regime and you can see here this is after ovulation the ovary looks like and then you artificial inseminate it and then you after 5 days of artificial insemination you collect the the embryos from the, the uterus by flushing it with the Uh, uh physiological saline and then you can collect these embryos into these uh, container and then you put it under a microscope and evaluate for the grade so this is a high grade embryo grade a you can see here you know and then these are poor grade embryos so you use the high grade embryos and then you put it into a recipient so you can use 1 2 3 4 5 supposing you had 10 em oocytes uh, embryos here and then you i uh, find five recipients for transfer and then you transfer it through a transvaginal method into the uterus and then wait for the concept the pregnancy to take place and eventually the delivery okay so this is a result of an embryo transfer technology this is a donor calf here a cow here and she has produced almost uh, you know 10 10 or 12 uh, you know calves in one super ovulation cycle by surrogate uh, these are the surrogate mothers here they were transferred into these recipients okay so for using this embryo transfer now coming to another technique that is very common in uh, animal production is genome editing okay genome editing or genome editing engineering is a type of genetic engineering where dna is inserted deleted modified or replaced in the genome of a living organism in 2018 the common method of such editing used engineering nuclease it was also known as molecular scissors okay so what happens that there are you know that this is a central dogma the dna gives to uh, rise to uh, uh, rna by transcription and then rna is translated into protein by uh, by translation right so this is the central dogma so what happens that genome editing technology actually uh, works at the dna level 
So what it does is that so you have this uh, DNA which is tightly packed in the chromosome. You have that various exon, intron, and then uh, this is a functional gene. So for example, this is the target gene, right? We want to target this gene. So very common method of uh, genome editing was uh, homologous recombination, which was used earlier. So you used to make a uh, you used to make a targeting vector with a homologous arm at the five prime and the three prime end, and, and a drug resistant gene was inserted. And when this gene was transformed into the cell, they undergo a re homologous recombination, and the gene was disrupted by the drug resistant gene. And we can select this particular uh, you know cell by uh, by uh, subjecting to a drug. So this was a very common technique. The the com the recombination rate was very low, almost one to three percent, and really had to work very hard. You know. So now the new technologies have come, known as the zinc finger nuclease. Talent known as transcription effector like uh, activator like effector and CRISPR Cas9 cluster regulatory interspace short palindromic repeats CRISPR associated protein. So these are all nuclease system which eventually leads. So they're all guided. You know, zinc finger nuclease use zinc finger. Talent use uh, you know three nucleotide base here. You know, and then uh, CRISPR use an mRNA RNA to actually. Target the the genome, and there is a double stranded break here in the genome. And what happens that that can be healed by two method. One is non homologous end joining, where you know uh, indel is inserted into that and they get into target mutagenesis. Or if you provide a homologous uh, DNA, the donor DNA can be inserted into the uh, the double stranded break region, leading to the target gene replacement. So this is a very common method of doing genome editing. and as i told you that this can be you know very helpful tool for genetic modification in case of in vitro fertilization as i told you earlier then in the in vitro fertilized embryos you can actually subject the 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 embryos after fertilization to genome editing tools and then you can actually uh, produce a genetically modified livestock through this method okay genome editing technology can also be used through male germ line so if you have a if you have a donor male you can you can take out the spermatogonium stem cells from the testes culture these spermatogonium stem cells do a genome editing in the spermatogonium stem cells and then validate by sequencing uh, that the genome editing has taken place and these modified ssc's can be inserted back into the donor uh, to a recipient okay and then when the recipient once these ssc's colonize the testes they produce the Uh, the genetically modified spermatozoa and these spermatozoa can be used for fertilize fertilization through artificial insemination or ivf and you can see here that genetically superior livestock can be born so this technique can be applied not only into the female but also into the male germ line this is the name the same picture that i have shown you that it can also be used in somatic cell nuclear transfer if you can see here the genome editing technology can be used in somatic cells and then can be used for somatic cell nuclear transfer and this technique is highly efficient almost 25 to 50% of targeted uh, alteration can be uh, it can be done in the uh, in the animal now coming to a final technique that i am going to talk about is transgenic animal and transgenic animal is uh, is one that carries a transgene that has been deliberately inserted into the genome the transgene is constructed in a recombinant dna technology so basically a transgene is a a dna uh, fragment which consists of a promoter a coding region protein coding region and for the adenylation signal so it is a complete gene transgene which is actually micro injected into the embryos earlier method was you simply take the naked dna and inject into a single cell embryo into the pro nuclei and once this embryo is transferred into the surrogate mother you can produce a transgenic livestock this is very inefficient now the new other method is somatic cell nuclear transfer and genome editing also where you can actually do a a, a, a targeted uh, replacement of a transgene into a specific loci and can produce a transgenic livestock okay so transgenic livestock is a reality now that there are a lot of transgenic animal is already exist in the in the in the world there are several transgenic livestock like like goat uh, cattle sheep and pigs which have a different usage in case of uh, animal health and benefit okay so they are also the, the, the transgenic animals uh, are used for production of pharmaceuticals in their milk 
they are also used for xenografts especially the pigs so pigs have been used as an organ donor very recently you must have read that the heart was transplanted in one of the humans and then recently it died after two months then you have they can also serve as a disease model you know because since livestock uh, are much more they have a longevity and the body size is similar to ours you know similar to humans so they can serve as a disease model they can be used for production of dietary supplement or functional food and they can also answer environmental problem okay so uh, conventional method of production of recombinant protein is fermenters or tissue culture and if you see these techniques are is very commonly used but the product produced from these uh, techniques are highly expensive okay because they requires a lot of scaling up and the glycosylation and post translational modification is not that efficient and they have very high cost of production and uh, but in uh, the transgenic animal has actually have uh, uh, you know corrected all these has taken care of answered all the questions answers to these questions like you know they are efficient in scaling up they have a correct glycosylation and post translational modification they are a eukaryotic system they have lower cost of production they have rapid production of transgenic founders and very high expression stability so if you see here uh, these are some of the recombinant produce uh, protein produced in the milk of several transgenic animal for example anti uh, uh, thrombin 3 you know this has been produced this is the first uh, been which is already in clinical approval which has been produced in goat milk then you have esterase in hebe eater alpha glycosidase albumin fibrogen collagen malarial vaccine and several several other recombinant proteins are produced in the milk of cattle goat rabbit and they are in the pre clinical or clinical stages so what happens that if you look at the uh, cost of uh, good of these uh, uh, product or the recombinant protein produced in the transgenic versus the cell culture system you can see here that if you take 50 kg of production per year a cell culture would cost you for per gram 147 dollars and transgenic animal it is reduced to only 20 dollars okay and if you take 300 kg of production per year you can see that the transgenic uh, recombinant protein is just 6 dollars so this is very very efficient and economical method of producing recombinant protein in the uh, in transgenic animal okay so transgenic animal goat produce pharmaceutical progeny like alpha fetal protein anti thrombin 3 plasminogen activator lactoferrin factor factor 9 uh, colony stimulating factor spider silk you know one of the uh, thing has been produced in uh, in the milk of the animal which is used for uh, suture material and many many things and lysozymes you know which has been used as antibacterial is been produced in uh, several livestock okay and they have also produced transgenic fish which expresses growth hormone you can see here is a transgenic fish which expresses growth hormone so you can see the size of the fish is quite large compared to the regular fish okay so let me summarize it now the biotechnology has revolutionized animal production by enhancing the reproductive and genetical capabilities of the animals several biotechnological innovations are in pipeline that are going to further enhance the production capabilities of animals there is a need for fresh talent to continue the innovation in this field and ethical issues permitting these technologies should always be kept in mind you understand that there is a lot of ethical issues that you need to address you know so you just cannot keep producing these animals for the fun of it you know so you know you need to be very careful in considering the ethical issues so i thank you very much for your attention now my talk is open for uh, for question thank you very much thank you doctor uh, the session is open for discussion i think in the chat box there are students have can you explain the principle behind the use of crispr cas9 till uh, okay so crispr cas9 technique is a very simple technique what happened that earlier we used to you know uh, do a homologous or gene disruption by you know looking at the homologous region on the dna now this technique allows you to use a small rna which is known as the guide rna you know and this guide rna actually binds to the region of your specific uh, in the genome and it will take the cas9 that is a nucleus protein along with it 
and cut that region okay so what happened naturally when you when you uh, cut the dna by uh, endonuclease uh, the natural repair mechanism will try to you know repair it and natural uh, uh, mechanism is not fool proof it will insert a mutation in it so if you insert a mutation like deletion or insertion the gene get disrupted okay so this is how the crispr cas9 work so this technique is highly efficient very specific and it is is very economical also you know you can do it in your lab very easily now in an ib we try to do it very regularly you know many of our colleagues do that you know easily in the in the in the embryo as well as in the cells Uh, for the attachment of mrna we need to just open the chain i mean the dna sequence right at a particular yeah. position so you do not need to do that you know the the normal mechanism of uh, you know unwinding takes place you don't have to provide any extra you know uh, uh, you know un- unwinding proteins to it you know so but naturally when the cell replication is taking place you know uh, the mrna will find its location to that genomic region uh so if we want a particular segment like a particular region then how will we attain that excuse me i i couldn't hear you properly can you repeat uh, it if we want a particular region i mean the uh, the region where the unbinding is not done natural unbinding is not done yeah okay so that region would be difficult to you know edit it you know so for that region uh probably you may have to you know uh, find an alternative method to do that you understand we in homologous recombination method but usually the gene which are see generally speaking the gene which are active are not in those winded up region okay we actually target genes which are you know uh, is going to give us a phenotype right so usually those regions are highly expressive active so uh, finding an mrna sequence to those region are very easy to do it can we use caspar scan for a virus to multiply on a required tissue and remain non multiplicative in others yeah it's it's possible actually you know you can actually uh, could you be little more elaborate on this question uh, krutika krutika right so what do you actually want to ask sir if i want to uh, make a virus get multiplied in uh, glioblastomal cells mm. i want to check for an oncolytic virotherapy and i mm. want to uh, you know like uh, multiply the virus and see if i can cure the glioblastomal cells with my bioengineered virus mm. Mm. and i want to use crispr cas9 technique for that and can it be like i can grow the i can make the virus multiply only in that particular tissue and not multiply in other tissues causing any other uh, consequences okay now that question needs to be like you know you you mean to say that you have a cell line right or you have a tissue cell line obviously uh, so cell line will be an homogeneous cell line right it will be from a defined uh, uh, all those cells would be of the same type right yes sir yeah so i could not understand your question you are talking about in the tissue that you do not want it to replicate into a different cell type right so a cell like for example i am injecting the oncolytic uh, virus into the human uh, brain tissue okay right so you want to use crispr cas9 to be very specific in targeting a special cell type there is it is it correct hello okay okay any other question i mean uh, cranberry is the first sheep cloning and two more sheep megan and morgan has been cloned rosalyn so why did cloning seem so much important and why dolly considers the biggest achievement in okay yeah that's a very good question so now remember that when she, uh, dolly was cloned you know uh, it was the first somatic cell nuclear transfer to have taken place in mammalian species okay remember there have been lot of work gone gone in uh, in amphibians and fishes where you know it was thought that the reprogramming of the cell somatic cell was much easier 
but what happens with the with the with the dolly the sheep was exemplary because a somatic cell was reprogrammed into an embryonic origin which could eventually give rise to a whole individual okay so that is why you know that was a very uh, you know uh, uh, breakthrough for the, the scientists to know eventually later on they found that in the mammary tissue from where the cell was originated they must have found some embryonic cells which actually were easy to reprogram right so uh, as we further as the field was further progressed so that is why it was such an important achievement at that point of time what is the success rate of artificial insemination okay so, so artificial insemination the success rate is 50 50 let me tell you okay it depends on so many things the most important factor is the 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 technicians uh, you know uh, excellence you know most of the time the semen that we freeze have 70 to 60% motility okay so the the efficiency of this depends on number one the stage at which the semen is inseminated it has to be in a right estrus stage number two the technician should deposit the semen into a right site of insemination that is that anterior part of the cervix okay so if these two things are met i would say that i would have almost 70 to 80% efficiency in getting the animal pregnant okay okay what was the section sir in in vitro fertilization why the surrogate mother is used instead of the same oocyte donor is it because the donor could not produce the offspring on other no no it's not like that so the whole idea of in vitro fertilization is that you have more number of embryos coming from one single prized animal and you multiply into many numbers of donors right so there you exploit is you super ovulate the animal means you get a lot of oocyte from it you take the oocyte from it and then you have the surrogate mother which is the same stage of uh, you know reproductive cyclicity and you transfer into them so that you can multiply it you know so if you put it back into the same animal uh, first of all it cannot sustain more than one pregnancy okay a cow can give rise to only one calf at a time so if you put it into one all the embryos into one you will end up killing up that cow right so you need to have surrogate mothers to take care of them okay okay was according to the, the most successful artificial technique so according to the most artif successful artificial technique as of now is artificial insemination it has been the most widespread application and it has brought in the white revolution the white revolution in this country is because of this artificial insemination technique okay what is the minimum what is that that is the minimum side effect okay which technique we can know that this bull progeny gives good production oh i didn't understand what you mean to say that uh, okay so bull progenies can see as i told you that artificial insemination is the propagation of the uh, the genetic potential of male so bull progenies can be done by artificial insemination but if you want to see the female genetic potential embryo transfer technology is the is the method okay there you can have lot of embryos coming from a female a cow and then you can put it into many many surrogate mother to produce the uh, more number of offspring from a prized animal or prized female okay any more questions <clears throat> uh, sir uh, murkan sir dr do yes. you see a question that i missed i don't want to miss on any question you know which yes, i think Think so far, answered all. Okay, okay. I'm uh, sorry if I'm not able to answer some of them satisfactorily. Uh, so I would like to tell you that uh, NIAB has a program of uh, uh, you know dissertation program for master go student and B Tech student every six month. Uh, so please apply for it if you want to you know learn more about techniques of animal biotechnology. Okay. So I would like to tell all the students here to keep an eye on the NIAB website for such calls. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Doctor Morgan. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for uh, being a patient listener and interacting with me. It was a great time I had. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
uh, students, we have one more lecture for the day. Uh, we'll wait for our guest to join us. Good morning, Dr. J.D. Good morning. Uh, students, we will continue with the third uh, lecture for the day. Uh, we have with us Dr. Uh, J.D. Kumar Palmer, ex product executive, Hester Bioscience Private Limited, Ahmedabad, uh, former employee of uh, SISTI, where he worked as a product development manager. He did his bachelor in veterinary science and animal husbandry from veterinary college Anand and master's in veterinary pharmacology and toxicology from Anand Agriculture University, Gujarat. Uh, he has also worked as a product manager at Phoenix Life Science, uh, Rotec, Haryana. Uh, his area of interest is Mustatis, uh, Devomer, nutritional therapeutic product development for animals. Uh, he has expertise in uh, laboratory animal handling. A routine health checkup for laboratory animals and histopathological examinations. Uh, with this uh, short introduction, I invite uh, Dr. Jadip to deliver his talk. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, before taking uh, much time, uh, I directly focus on uh, today's topic. Doctor, screen is visible. Uh, yes, doctor. Okay, okay. 
uh, herbal treatment uh, for uh, mastitis in cattle. Uh, nowadays, uh, in animals, a uh, lot of uh, infectious disease uh, occur in animal, but the most common disease uh, which affected in cattle, also in uh, buffalo, is mastitis. And uh, due to mastitis problem, there is a uh, loss of uh, economic loss to farmer. Now uh, we understand uh, about what is the importance of herbal treatment uh, for curing mastitis in animal. Now, first start with introduction. What is a mastitis? Mastitis is an inflammatory response of other tissue in uh, uh, memory gland caused due to physical trauma or due to infection of microorganism. Uh, simply say that uh, uh, the process by uh, uh, goes due to trauma or any infectious organism. Now, what is the inflammation? Uh, okay. Uh, inflammation is a process uh, by which body white blood cell or things that make the protect the body from infections caused by the bacteria. Uh, in inflammation, uh, there is a, a role of uh, macrophages, neutrophils, and uh, other inflammatory cells that uh, uh, leads to a vasodilatory and hyperemic uh, uh, activity at affected site of order of any part of the body. And due to the hyperemia or vasodilatory uh, property, uh, which leads to the uh, swelling of affected site. And the main uh, five cardinal sign of inflammation, uh, which includes the heat, that means due to hyperemia, increase of blood flow, which uh, leads to a heat at the affected site of uh, animal body. Second one is uh, redness. Due to vasodilatory activity, there is a, a redness at affected site swelling. Due to there is a, a, a role of uh, the neutrophils and macrophages, uh, exudate formation at the infectious site. And exudates play important role in uh, swelling of affected site. And uh, due to swelling and uh, redness, there is a pain at affected site. And uh, due to all the uh, for sign pain, heat, redness, and swelling, there is a loss of function of affected part of animal body. If uh, infection or inflammatory process at other, uh, the other tissue or uh, uh, not properly work. And due to the uh, uh, loss of function of other tissue, there is a decrease in milk production. Now, what is the factor or agent which is responsible for causing a disease in animal, and particularly mastitis? A uh, lot of factor, mainly uh, pathogen factor, environmental factor, host factor. Uh, in this uh, pathogen means include a bacterial infection, mycoplasmal infection, or mycotic or fungal infection. Uh, in bacteria, uh, include gram positive, gram negative uh, bacteria. Mycoplasmal and fungal infection also play a role in uh, causing a infection and responsible for a inflammatory process in the order of animal. Second factor is the environmental factor. An environmental factor, first one is the milking machine. Uh, nowadays in India, most of dairy farmer, in uh, uh, that dairy, dairy farmer, animal produce a higher milk yield. At that time, uh, not uh, hand milking is allowed due to uh, number increase in number of uh, 
cow for that uh, mainly farmer use a milking machine but uh, uh, there is a various advantage of milking machine but one disadvantage of using a milking machine uh, using a milking machine for milking purpose at that time the pressure uh, in milking machine is a higher and due to the pressure uh, uh, which leads to a damage to uh, other tissue of animal and which uh, ultimately leads a inflammatory process uh, of odor in animal. Second one is the milking technique. In India, uh, uh, mostly as a village area, mainly two type of milking uh, method or uh, milking technique performed by um, animal owner. First one is uh, by full head milking. In that, uh, uh, using a thumb, and uh, using a full hand, the teeth uh, pressed by full hand, and after that, uh, uh, milk secreted from teeth. But uh, second one is a knuckling that is using of nail by uh, pressing the teeth of animal and uh, by uh, pressing uh, teeth by uh, nail, the milk come out from teeth. And due to the uh, nail injury, there is a chance of uh, uh, inflammatory process or infection of odor in animal. Third one is a dietary factor. Dietary factor play a major role because nutrition is a main important uh, component for animal. If nutrition is not proper given to animal, it leads to a uh, nutritional deficiency and also a immune uh, suppression in animal. Fourth one is the housing. Uh, housing is a main important because uh, some uh, animal owner uh, keep animal uh, on a uh, kacha floor, means a dusting area or in open area. At that time, the source of infection or bacterial uh, infection are uh, main cause uh, for the inflammatory process. Uh, fifth one is the hygiene. Uh, in village area, uh, hygienic precaution not uh, uh, properly maintained to keep animal um, uh, in uh, also not a proper cleanliness at the floor of uh, animal where the uh, animal kept. Uh, <coughs> means uh, environmental factor also a play important role uh, to a uh, prevention of uh, uh, mastitis or uh, also in terms of uh, say that uh, if uh, environmental factor or this factor not uh, proper uh, um, take care that and which leads to a inflammatory process or mastitis in the animal. Uh, third one is a host factor. Host factor include a dry period, milking interval, milk yield, and other confirmation. Dry period that means the period at uh, uh, in animal after a uh, 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 parturition, uh, animal give milk up to uh, uh, seven to eight month, and uh, during a, a pregnancy, it means the uh, pregnancy and delivery, the time between uh, pregnancy and delivery up uh, during uh, required a means nine months. But after a uh, seven to eight month of pregnancy, animal owner uh, not allowed to milking animal. The, the, it means time period uh, about uh, one and a half, one to two month period. Uh, during that uh, animal owner not allowed to milking a animal and uh, uh, if animal produce a high milk and uh, suddenly stoppage of milking which leads to a uh, accumulation of extra milk in order of animal and uh, accumulated milks the source of uh, infection in animal. Second one is a milking interval. If animal produce a higher milk that means a in a day up uh, to uh, 15 to 20 liter of milk per day 
at that time the practice performed uh, or necessary practice performed uh, for a uh, complete removal of milk from udder is a three time milking in animal but some farm, uh, farmer or animal owner not a perform a this practice only two uh, milking on only in a two times a day so that at that time also the accumulation of milk or extra milk uh, remaining in udder and which is source of infection in animal milk yield if higher milk yield there is a chance of uh, infection in the animal and also a other confirmation that is the anatomical structure which leads to a uh, chances of infection in animal uh, another is the other defense other defense that means the uh, uh, immunity of animal if uh, immunity of animal is lower that may lead uh, chances of uh, infectious agent enter into the udder and uh, which leads to a inflammation or uh, uh, mastitis in animal teeth injury uh, teeth injury by uh, animal owner or by any hard objects injury uh, also uh, uh, one of the cause for uh, mastitis in animal age and breed uh, the susceptibility of mastitis uh, differ from age and breed of animals Uh, various organisms uh, are responsible for causing a mastitis in animal. Uh, contagious organisms like Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Mycoplasma, and Coronobacterium. Environmental organism uh, includes a Streptococcus and uh, Coliform bacteria. Opportunistic microorganism like Staphylococcus and other uh, organism which uh, leads to a Infection in animal are Pseudomonas, Actinomyces, and Nocardia. And the, the source of organism, <coughs> uh, the main source is the infected odor, uh, which uh, also include a environmental factor, the bedding material of animal, contaminated soil, and contaminated water. Also, a uh, manure, a, uh, the play important role. Uh, as a <coughs> spread of infection and cause of infection in uh, order of animal. Uh, now, by which process or uh, mechanism of uh, produce a inflammatory condition in order of the animal? First, organism invite the order to, to the teeth canal. After that, the organism migrate up to the teeth canal and colonize into the secretory cell. After that, colonized organism produce a toxic substance which is harmful to the milk producing cell. This is the uh, way of uh, process of infection. First, uh, organism enter to teeth and colonize up to the uh, secretory cell. And after toxin release, which damage to the uh, secretory cell of udder. Type of mastitis, mainly two type of mastitis. First one is a uh, subclinical and second one is a clinical. Now we first uh, uh, understand about the clinical mastitis. The name itself uh, indicate that the clinical mastitis uh, means there is a clinical sign of mastitis in animal in clinical uh, mastitis there is a uh, three types mild moderate and severe in mild case of mastitis uh, there is a abnormal milk of animal includes uh, bloody milk milk flakes and persin milk in moderate type of mastitis uh, swelling of teeth or other heat and pain of the other teeth. In, in severe cases, um, there is a fever, anorexia, and so of animal. While in uh, subclinical mastitis, the absence of visual sign and symptoms. There is a no sign and uh, symptoms uh, of animal, but 
the increase in number of somatic cell count in a milk that's a uh, sign not clinical but the indicate uh, indicator of the uh, subclinical mastitis in animal now we understand about the why uh, mastitis treatment is impo important because due to the mastitis the economic loss in india per annum is uh, 7165 crore there is a lot lot of economic loss due to the mastitis uh, in animals which includes 35 percentage due to the milk production losses because uh, when a animal suffering from mastitis condition or other swelling animal not allowed for milking or decrease in a milk production milk production losses up to 35 31 percentage second one is a veterinarian and drug means when animals suffering from mastitis at that time uh, animal owner called to veterinarian and a veterinarian visit the animal and during the treatment uh, for treatment uh, of mastitis uh, nowadays use a, a higher antibiotic and a higher generation antibiotic price is uh, higher so uh, when animal suffering from mastitis at that time uh, owner uh, give away uh, lots of money for treatment of um, uh, animal to the veterinarian third one uh, discard discard in milk because uh, when uh, uh, animal suffering from mastitis at that time uh, pus or uh, blood in milk so that pus or contaminated milk not used for human consumption so that uh, 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 the milk from affected or milk from mastitis affected cow uh, are discarded so that the uh, about 18 uh, percent uh, uh, losses due to the discarded milk four percent loss due to the excess labor demand because uh, treatment of animal and care of animal required a labor and 23% uh, due to the premature culling. Culling means uh, sometimes in severe mastitis cases in animal, uh, all four teeth of animal uh, are not useful. That means a blockage of teeth of animal and animal are not uh, uh, used for the production purpose that unproduced or un uh, uh, productive animal uh, are uh, not useful and animal owner uh, not kept that unproduced uh, or unproductive animal. Now, uh, main, uh, what are the method of detection of mustatis? First one is a visualization and palpation of order. Uh, means uh, if a person will or blood in milk or any milk flags that's a sign of or indication of mastitis also uh, palpation of order when uh, animal owner or veterinary doctor palpate the order at that time the hardness of order is fail and that is sign of uh, infectious agent uh, or uh, infection of mustat uh, order and uh, if the animal suffering from mastitis condition Second one is the detection of somatic cell count by California mastitis test. Means uh, mastitis or inflammatory process mainly uh, due to the uh, white blood cell, mainly WBC. And from uh, uh, affected animal, the milk uh, have a higher amount of somatic cell count which a indicated a uh, mastitis or infection present in the order of animal and which detect by <laughs> now, 
what are the treatment option for for mastitis first one is your use of antibiotic because mastitis condition caused due to the uh, uh, infectious agent by bacteria the killing of bacteria required antibiotic treatment second one is uh, due to inflammatory condition there is a requirement of intramammary infusion of anti inflammatory agent for a reduces swelling of order also during a uh, uh, mastitis animal uh, immunity somehow lower so that uh, required a immune booster and also uh, multivitamins and mineral mixture for a uh, supportive therapy to the animal and also a uh, nowadays in uh, india or in village area some uh, ethno veterinary and homeopathic uh, uh, formulation use to treat the animal <coughs> now what are the drawback of using a antibiotic for treatment of mastitis in cow because uh, for treatment aspect uh, mainly veterinary and para veterinarian use a huge number of antibiotic but uh, one disadvantage uh, of using a uh, drastic or higher amount of antibiotic is antibiotic resistance that means uh, when any uh, when any veterinarian or para vet uh, give antibiotic treatment at that time antibiotic uh, uh, schedule or antibiotic uh, complete dose uh, fulfill meant is a must sometime uh, veterinarian or para veterinarian treatment give a uh, incomplete dose of antibiotic or higher dose of antibiotic or somehow uh, lower dose of antibiotic that means a proper dose and proper schedule of antibiotic not follow for a, a, a treatment which leads to a resistance of antibiotic against infection in animal second one is a antibiotic residue in milk higher amount of using a antibiotic in treatment which means a uh, antibiotic uh, treatment an antibiotic pass into the milk of animal and that uh, antibiotic resistance also transmit to the human because human uh, consumption a milk from animal or the animal affected from a mastitis condition and the milk from affected animal and also the uh, uh, antibiotic treated milk of animal which transmit a uh, resistance of antibiotic to human also that is the main uh, uh, concern <coughs> and also a uh, higher generation antibiotics have a higher amount of or a higher uh, price of antibiotic and the cost of treatment is a uh, somehow higher so that not economically uh, uh, economic to the animal owner also now uh, we focus on uh, ethno veterinary medicine now in nowadays in, in india ethno veterinary practice uh, um, uh, lots of uh, farmer or uh, animal owner uh, use ethno veterinary medicine uh, what is the meaning of ethno veterinary medicine ethno veterinary means ethno veterinary knowledge is acquired through the practical experience and has traditionally been passed down orally from generation to generation that means what is the whatever the knowledge from uh, uh, elder people directly passed to the uh, his or her son <coughs> or means generation to generation the various component of several herbs shrooms plants are used as a medicine for treatment of many types of human 
and animal disease. In uh, uh, herbal medicine, comprehensive plant-based medicine can be used for therapeutic, prophylactic, and diagnostic application in animal healthcare and disease prevention. Uh, why ethno-veterinary or Ayurvedic treatment uh, is necessary in human and also in animal? Because uh, using a allopathic or antibiotic treatment uh, required an advanced antibiotic also and uh, uh, complete uh, dose schedules means at least uh, uh, three to seven day of treatment of antibiotic in uh, animal also in, or in human also and various side effect of antibiotic uh, uh, residue and that's also a uh, some toxic metabolic uh, passes into the milk meat and uh, in also in animal byproduct uh, due to that Hence, in uh, the rural area of India, the traditional herbal, homeopathic, and Ayurvedic medicine are used by the local people for the treatment of mastitis. Uh, various advantages of using a herbal medicine because uh, herbal medicine uh, serves as a safer alternative to the antibiotics. Second one is the lower cost of production. Uh, no cost required for uh, uh, herbs because uh, herbs are naturally available from plant veggies. No resistance issue because uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, allopathic antibiotic resistance are the main cons main uh, uh, concern. But uh, using a uh, herbal medicine or Ayurvedic, there is no resistance issue and also a uh, reduced mortality in dairy cattle by using a herbal treatment because uh, any herb or any uh, plant-based uh, herbs are not um, uh, produce a uh, adverse effect on animal. So that uh, is a safer and no any mortality uh, uh, seen in animal. In Gujarat National Dairy Development uh, Board uh, formulate a uh, ethno veterinary practice for treatment of mastitis. Uh, for all type of means any clinical or subclinical mastitis, use a aloe vera, turmeric, calcium hydroxide, and lemon. The uh, all uh, ingredient first blend and make a ready placed and the the paste handfully uh, 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 add in about uh, 150 to 200 ml of water. After that, uh, that mixer applied through the throughout the order. And this application repeat uh, up to 10 times a day for five days. And uh, fed a two lemons twice a day for three days. And this practice is commonly used by farmer in all over the Gujarat and uh, most common practice for treatment of mastitis in animals. Second one is the udder edema. And, uh, when a, a uh, swelling of udder of animal at that time, sesame or mustard oil, turmeric powder and garlic juice. From uh, uh, this paste, when applied to the udder, uh, which is uh, which leads to a decrease in swelling of order and this practice also a common practice uh, to treat the other edema in animals third practice is uh, for a teeth obstruction when a severe mastitis condition uh, there is a blockage of uh, blockage in the teeth and milk not come out from the teeth at that time, freshly uh, flock and clean neem stick, turmeric powder, and butter are used for treatment of teeth obstruction in animal. Uh, in preparation, uh, neem <coughs> leaf stock at the big pile length based on the teeth length, the cut 
in the coat coat with turmeric powder and butter or ghee mixer to one the neem leaf stalk after that insert the coated neem leaf stalk into the affected teeth in animal into a anti clockwise direction and replace with the fresh neem stick after the each milking means after each milking neem leaf stalk or neem uh, uh, leaf stalk inserted into the teeth of animal and very effective treatment for a teeth obstruction or blockage of obstruction <coughs> in a teeth uh, from mathura college dr deep narayan singh validate various various practice for treatment of mastitis in animal uh, for am is application of uh, paste of turmeric and uh, phrase leaves of drumstick mix with common salt over the infected udder of cattle and buffalo thrice in a day is very effective also aloe vera turmeric and lime paste uh, found suitable for treatment of all type of mastitis in animal without any adverse uh, effect on animal body um, feeding a uh, 20 to 30 gram uh, camphor in banana fruit twice in a day up to the three day is very also effective in a milk with a blood or abscess condition <coughs> also in a, a mild teeth infection fresh leaf rock and clean leaves stop up neem leaves and making a turmeric powder or butter ghee or paste uh, is uh, also important for a teeth blocking. Now, various uh, researchers uh, uh, carried out a study for a herbs or plants against a uh, antibiotic or antimicrobial activity of plants against a mastitis causing organism. Uh, uh, mainly ethanolic extract of coriandum, vitia vinifera, and gingiber of Isolani, one of the growth of Staphylococcus aureus, isolated from milk of cow, infected with the clinical mastitis. Uh, and uh, using a 500, uh, 50, 100, 20, and 400 mg per ml of concentration of plant extract. And plant extract produce a zone of inhibition against a uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Also, Edward and its co worker in 2012 studied the synergistic antimicrobial activity of food ethanolic extract of garlic and neem leaves against bovine mustardis pathogen. And uh, garlic and neem extract. So the zone of inhibitions against a zone uh, uh, of inhibition against the mastitis causing pathogen. <coughs> also, in using a, a, a Tynospora cordifera lit extract against bovine pathogen, uh, again uh, against bovine pathogen, and uh, Tynospora cordifera extract. Uh, a so zone of inhibition against E. coli. That means a plant extract uh, commonly uh, act as a uh, antimicrobial agent uh, against a mustatis pathogen. Uh, using a curcumin in dairy sheep diets for control a subclinical mustatis. <coughs> Uh, curcumin given up to 60 milligram per animal per day and uh, from day 0 to day 10 after a feeding of curcumin increase in milk production fat content protein and lactose while a somatic cell count from day 0 to day 10 decrease in the somatic cell count and also decrease a total uh, bacterial count that means curcumin increase the uh, milk production and decrease a uh, uh, infectious agent or a 
increases uh, decreases somatic cell count and total bacterial count in milk that means uh, curcumin act as a antimicrobial agent and also stimulate a milk production in animal uh, using a osim sanctum in bovine subclinical mastitis and uh, uh, using a, a treatment aspect uh, osimum sanctum uh, <laughs> decreases somatic cell count in animal and from day zero uh, and after the uh, treatment at 28 day uh, california mustatis score <laughs> is decreased that means a osimum symptoms also a uh, responsible herb uh, to treat a mustatis condition and decrease a uh, infectious uh, causing agent and decreases somatic cell count in uh, milk of animals. Uh, when use of aloe vera, turmeric, and five gram of limes, it's a most effective treatment for uh, a mastitis in animal. And after treatment of aloe vera, turmeric, and in, uh, limes, uh, there is a decrease uh, in uh, uh, California mustatis uh, test uh, uh, score and also decrease in the somatic cell count of milk in animals. Uh, there is a uh, various uh, ethnobatinary herbal medicine used against a pathogen, uh, mainly aloe vera, curcuma longa, gingiver officinalis. Lots of uh, herbal plant used for treatment of uh, mastitis and also a antimicrobial activity against various pathogens like Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, uh, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. Lots of uh, organism and uh, plenty of plant use against a mustardis pathogen as an antimicrobial agent. Now, uh, what do you understand by uh, uh, reverse pharmacology and uh, what is the importance of reverse pharmacology uh, uh, in a Srishti? mainly uh, scientists work on reverse pharmacology means uh, science of integrating document clinical experience and experimental observation into the lead to the transdisciplinary exploratory study and further developing these into the drug candidate to the robust clinical clinical time in the simple way first whatever the traditional practice the same to same practice performed on animal and if a practice give a positive result on animal in a small scale after that the laboratory trial that means in vitro trial performed on, uh, in a laboratory and from the same practice uh, drug are developed means from a uh, traditional knowledge to the develop a finalized complete product that's called say reverse pharmacology uh, for a treatment of mastitis uh, for, uh, i use a uh, about 300 to 350 practice from 60 better database uh, which are mainly used for a treatment of mastitis uh, in animal by village people and these are the uh, number of plant commonly used by a farmer like citrus lemon, corindus tamar, cinnamon camphora, aloe vera, Alium satabium, Ejaritha indica, curcuma longa. These are the plant commonly used by a village people for the treatment of homeostasis. And uh, this is the number 
that means say number of innovator or number of farmer uh, commonly perform a same practice for a treatment of uh, mastitis from this database using this uh, uh, number of uh, repeated practice uh, i selected a uh, coriander and camphor for a treatment of uh, mastitis in animal and animal suffering from uh, mastitis uh, uh, at that time uh, the diagnosis performed for detection of mastitis is based on a paper based device mainly uh, developed by uh, srishti in this device put a drop of milk and after the putting a drop of milk within a few seconds the color uh, seen on uh, that uh, paper based device and that uh, uh, indicates a uh, positive or negative means a grade of infection agent present in a milk uh, if uh, the higher number or means greenish line that means the uh, grade of infection or infection uh, present in milk is a uh, higher from confirmation of that uh, uh, in milk treatment or uh, treatment given to animal uh, using a 500 gram of coriander leaves at morning and 500 gram of uh, coriander leaves at evening and 2 gram of camphor with the millet bread twice in a day up to the 3 day treatment after this uh, this uh, uh, traditional based knowledge based treatment uh, i found that uh, 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 affected animal uh, shows the decrease in swelling of uh, uh, udder and also increasing the milk up to the 500 ml in animals that's indicates the positive result of coriander and camphor also same practice uh, uh, performed in uh, uh, Manikpur, Mansa, uh, Gujarat from uh, uh, another uh, animals and the same result uh, found uh, by using a coriander and camphor treatment. That means a uh, traditional knowledge or farmer using knowledge using a coriander and camphor both are work as a uh, both are work as a treatment for mastitis in animal. Uh, the same uh, result uh, also uh, seen in uh, uh, animal suffering from mastitis. Uh, at that time also uh, milk, uh, flax in milk. And using a coriander and camphor treatment within the three day, uh, uh, the infection uh, diminish and animal uh, uh, milk yield uh, on swelling both are uh, decreased. That means a uh, uh, using a coriander and camphor for treatment of mastitis in animal are very effective uh, uh, as a treatment aspect. And, uh, and from this uh, uh, using a traditional knowledge based practice. Uh, I uh, formulate and develop one product named as a musty remedy based on traditional knowledge based herbal formulation for treatment of mustatis and the main uh, herbs uh, which includes in this product are uh, coriander, cinnamonum, pinospora, within a somnifera and also a uh, vitamins uh, A, B, uh, and uh, uh, natural vitamin C from Emblekia officinalis. That's me the complete uh, uh, formulation for treatment of mastitis. And uh, this uh, uh, product uh, use uh, for, for any condition, means blood in milk, pulse in milk, udder edema, or inflamed udder uh, of animal. And the treatment schedule for five days. Uh, 50 ml uh, liquid uh, give animal to morning and 50 ml to uh, uh, evening in the five day complete course for treatment uh, of mastitis in any condition of 
animal and there is a very effective formulation and very effective product for treatment of mastitis in animals thank you thank you so much uh, doctor the session is open for discussion if you have any doubts or clarification you can ask dr jay any questions So in case of no questions, we will uh, end up the session. Uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Jaydeep Parmal for joining us today's session and elaborating the ethno practice, ethno pharmacology practices being followed, and then product is being developed through the different uh, treatments for even mastitis. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us today. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, students, that's all for the day. Uh, we will end up the today's classes here. Uh, tomorrow we will get back with the, another, uh, another session in a natural product. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Tomorrow.